Well, thank you, Brother Joe. Thank you, praise team, and thank you, Ben. I, every Sunday, am blessed and thrilled, and uh, sometimes I'm just a little surprised because I find out you got folks that can sing that I didn't know they could sing, and uh, they didn't look like they could sing, but they can, you know, <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. Y'all all do a wonderful, wonderful job, and this morning, of course, that last praise song was taken right out of the Psalms, and it's a wonderful, wonderful way to introduce the message that we are be, we we're sharing together this morning. Tomorrow morning, this morning, we're sharing the fifth, the sixth, excuse me, of a series of messages that we began several weeks ago on I Love My Church. We've shared several different aspects of that series on January 20th, Why I Love My Church. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. We spent that morning looking at all the reasons why we ought to love the church that Jesus gave himself for, the bride of Christ. On January the 27th, because I love my church, I will seek to help build a happy, holy, harmonious, healthy fellowship. And you know, that's the responsibility of all of us here, not just one or two, but all of us, to contribute to the health and the happiness and the harmony and the holiness of God's people and the family. On February the 3rd, I preached a message entitled, Because I Love My Church, I Will Be a Servant. It was there where Jesus said that the greatest among you shall be your uh, servant, shall be the least among you. And we talked about the importance of being a, a servant and having a servant's heart. And then on February the 10th, I preached a message because I love my church. I will love, pray for, support, and encourage our pastor, our staff, and our leadership. And we talked about the importance of lifting up those who lead us in every area of our church's life. And we've got so many gifted, committed, godly leaders who need your prayers and appreciate your prayers. Last Sunday... Because I love my church, I will fellowship. And we talked about that word koinonia, which is often found in the New Testament, which describes a deep fellowship and oneness of the body of Christ. And today, because I love my church, I will worship. And you might think at first, well, Brother Jackie, <coughs> excuse me, we all understand that. We, uh, <coughs> pardon me, we don't need a sermon on I love my church so I worship because I'm here worshiping already. But the truth is, you can be at church and not worship. And you can worship and not be at church. Now, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that you stay home next Sunday. What I am saying is worship is more than coming and sitting in a pew. Now, there's a lot more involved in that, and, and this morning I want you to do something with me, if I could ask you to do this. I, there are a number of passages that are listed in your worship guide. There'll be some more that I'll share that are not listed. You may want to jot those down. I'll give you that reference. But rather than you trying to turn to all of them and look them all up, I just want you to, to, to just listen to the reading of the word, and I'm going to read them all for us, all under the theme, because I love my church, I will, I will worship. The first one's from Ezra, chapter 3, verses 10 through 13. The background, I think, is one that is incredibly significant. It was in 538 B.C. that Zerubbabel and Joshua led God's people back to Jerusalem, who had been in exile in Babylonian captivity for a long, long time. And from 538 to 516 B.C., the children of God were preparing to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. And so our passage that's before us this morning in Ezra chapter 3 is when they've come to the time of dedicating the altar the place where the sacrifices are made, and then the complete uh, the first six chapters are really all about the rebuilding and the dedicating of the new temple. But I just want you to know the people who have been in exile are beyond themselves, beside themselves. 
They can't wait to worship. They can't wait to get to the house of God. They can't wait to come and dedicate the altar to the Lord. Listen to what Ezra says. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. With trumpets. I, I believe the trumpet may be my favorite instrument of all, Brother Joe. I love them all, but I love the trumpet. I took trumpet in school. In fact, I thought about majoring in trumpet, but after two weeks, I figured that might not be a good idea. And I did something else. And the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals. We need to get us some cymbals up here, Joe. Uh, yeah, just give Ronnie something else to do and give him a pair of cymbals and, and praise the Lord at the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. Now listen, and they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endures forever. Ever, ever heard that? We've sung that often. Toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men who had seen the first house, the first temple, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, oh, I want you to try to picture this, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud with joy. And so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout from the noise of the weeping of the prophet. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. <laughs> I remember the first time I ever heard shouting in a church. We were at Camp Zion in Myrtle, Mississippi in the 1970s when Percy Ray was the pastor of that church there. And I wish I had time to tell you about that tabernacle camp meeting and about that situation. But I remember an old boy got up there. He was from South Carolina, Tim. He uh, preached on, I remember it, even though it's been all these years, he preached on the day that Jesus died. And I just got goosebumps thinking about it. The day that Jesus died. And he talked about it was a prophesied day. It was a painful day. It was a purposeful day. It was a powerful day. And I tell you what, there's a little lady on the front row. She had to be in her 80s. I know she was. She just had it about as much as she could stand. <laughs> and she stood up in the front row, front pew, stood up and shouted and waved her hands and said, praise God, glory to God. And I ain't never heard a thing like that in all my life. But you know what I found out? That's all right. You're going to find out more than I. Are you saying, Brother Jackie, are you admonishing that we start jumping pews and standing in the pews? No. I just want you to feel free to worship because he alone is worthy of worship. And if you had been there in Jerusalem that day when they dedicated the temple and dedicated the altar, you'd have had a spell too. They just had a great time. When we, we love the Lord's house. We love the church because of worship, because we worship. Psalm 34, 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Every once in a while, Joe, you've never heard this, but I have. Some dear, sweet, spirited saint who just got weaned on a dill pickle. Just sour, got their lips stuck out. I wish we wouldn't sing those little ditty choruses. I don't know why we sing those choruses. Well, because we want to be biblical. And listen, do you know that many of the psalms, although the word psalm means praise song, and many of those were overflowing spontaneous songs of praise. Now, I do confess that there may be some choruses that you like more than others, but the reason we do is because it is just one more way. I mean, hymns are wonderful, and I love the old-fashioned hymns, and I especially like them when you put it up. That, when we uh, put on the, uh, let's see, is it Amazing Grace where we put the tag on? 
and my chains, oh, when we get to that place, I say, my chains are gone. I just, I just want to go on to be with the Lord. It's absolutely glorious. And, it, and, and so the psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall especially or continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Do you know when you are in a show enough, <laughs> that's the way we'd say it in Lacey Springs, a show enough worship experience, you'll go home happy in Jesus. There's something about worship that just takes your mind off your, your hurts and your cares and your burdens for a while and lets you focus on the goodness of the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. By the way, somebody once said, I believe that worship ought to be reverent. I believe that too. But there is a difference in reverence and rigor mortis. <laughs> worship ought to be the expression of a life that's been transformed by the power of God and passionately in love with the Lord Jesus. Make a Psalm 98, 4 and 5, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth, make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with a harp and, and with a harp and the voice of the psalm. And then Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now listen. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And God's people said, amen. amen. It just it gets gooder. Listen, uh, that's not good grammar, but it does get gooder. Psalm 150, praise you the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. There it is again. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to the day that somebody just breaks out happy in Jesus and does a holy dance. I had never seen that before, but I... Uh, praise Him with the timbrel and dance and praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals and praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. You kind of get the idea of where we're going this morning. We're talking about, I love my church and because I love my church, I'm going to worship because when I gather together with the body of Christ and the family of faith, it gives me an opportunity to celebrate the greatest news in the whole world that Jesus left heaven, came to this old world, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, was buried in a borrowed tomb, got up on the, that third day and is coming back for the bride of Christ. Folks, we've got a lot to be happy about. Amen? Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I remember being in Southwestern Seminary and studying on one particular day this passage. And I remember the professor saying, this passage is the most glorious portrait of worship in the Old Testament. It is Isaiah. Isaiah Isaiah's cousin, the king, Uzziah, has died. I remember the day when I was in the seventh grade. The young people, I know it's hard, I think... You probably believe I was born this old, this big, and this ugly. Uh, I was a normal person one time. How many of y'all in the seventh grade? Anybody in the seventh grade? Oh, great time, great grade. But I remember in the seventh grade that the secretary of our school came and knocked on the door. Some of you know where I'm going, 1963. And she said to Mr. Stidger, my math teacher, the President of the United States has just been shot. John F. Kennedy had just been shot in Dallas. As long as I live and as long as I have my mind, I will never forget that moment 
of feeling, a sense of personal loss. And in Isaiah's day, when King Uzziah died, not only was Uzziah the, the, king, the king, he was the, the king was almost a deity figure and beloved by the people in most cases. And he was a relative of, of Isaiah. And Isaiah's heart was broken. And so in that context, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. It's amazing how when your heart is broken, the Lord shows up to comfort you and encourage you and bless you and get you through. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And he cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, by the way, worship does something to us personally in the way of reminding us of how holy God is and how sometimes unholy or how far our holiness is from his. We, the only holiness we have is that which is imputed to us by the righteousness of God in Christ. We are not holy in and of ourselves, but he gives us of his holiness and he asks us to walk in holy walk with him. And Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and I said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity uh, is taken away, and thy sin is purged. That's what the angel said to Isaiah. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, Lord, here am I, send me. Two other passages briefly, and then just a brief word about worship and the significance of it. In John 4, when Jesus was talking to now what we know to be the woman at the well, in verses 23 and 24, the Samaritans worshiped at Mount Gerizim. And the discussion between the woman and Jesus uh, ensued about where, where was the right place to worship. The Jews worshiped in Jerusalem. The Samaritans worshiped at Mount Gerizim. And so Jesus said to this woman, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But the Father seeketh such to worship him. Did you hear that? The Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then finally, in Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, that wonderful, glorious, closing chapter. It is the last worship encounter described in the Bible. Now in Revelation chapter 22, there is a verse where it says that John fell down before one of the elders. But the elder said, get up, John. You're not to worship me. I'm not the one. Jesus, the risen one, is the one worthy of our worship. But listen to what the revelation says. And John, in that heavenly city, said in the four beasts, each of them had six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within, and they rested not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. We sing that often. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the 20 and four elders fall down before him who sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy. Kind of makes you want to wreck out saying it, doesn't it, Joe? Thou art worthy to receive honor and glory and, uh, and power. For he, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. 
Just, just a few thoughts this morning for us to hang our, our spiritual hat on for just a few brief moments. I thought it interesting that no place in the Scripture is the term worship defined. It is described in the places we've read and in so many more, but nowhere is it defined. But the dictionary, Webster says, that worship is, quote, an extravagant respect or admiration for or devotion to an object or a person of esteem. I thought it interesting. If I were to give you a Bible quiz this morning and ask you, where do you think the first expression, description, example of worship is found in the Bible? Now, I, you can think about that for a moment. I was a little surprised as I did my research, but many commentators believe it is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verse 5, when Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of the mountain. And Abraham knows he's been asked by God to sacrifice his son. And it's there they go to the, the Abraham tells the son, we're going to worship and to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. It's interesting that the Hebrew words for worship, and there really are about four of them, one of them means temple service, and uh, one of them really means submission or surrender. I like this. I told uh, Catherine a while ago I was going to talk about, uh, uh, about her and Gerald this morning again, and, and she's been worried ever since, but uh, let me tell you why. One of the Greek words, the, one of the, the Greek word most often used in the New Testament for worship is proskuneo. Now, there are about three other words that are related that refer to sacrifice or service. But the word pros is the preposition, which means to or toward. Now, listen to this. I think maybe some of you the other day were shocked. Shocked. <laughs> Gerald and Catherine had their first anniversary. That's pretty good for 85 years old to have first anniversary. Pretty good. And I had them stand. <laughs> and I had them kiss. And you should have seen some of your eyes like, dear God, not. Not in church. Not in church. And then you really stroked out when I said, that's pitiful. Put it on her, son. And he, I mean, he, he gave her a slobber knocker then. <laughs> but do you know that the word proskuneo, pros to or toward, and kuneo means, can you guess? To kiss. <laughs> Woo! That means when you come to worship, it's like a man kissing his bride. You're just simply saying, Lord, I just want to tell you, I love you. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> now some of you are nervous. <laughs> and some of you don't dare let me know when your anniversary is. because you're <laughs> But I want to tell you, worship is expressed as we express our love for and admiration for the Lord. Our culture... Has interesting, interestingly sought to pigeonhole worship in a lot of different ways, particularly styles. We're not talking about a style this morning. We're not talking about a contemporary style or a blended traditional, a casual or a charismatic style, a liturgical style, a meditative style, or other, or maybe a celebrative style. True worship is really described in many ways in the Bible. If you really want a manual on worship, look at the Word of God. And God will give us so many examples. And I, uh, I want to give you six of these, and, uh, and I promise you I'll be brief, but I want you to, to listen carefully to the biblical descriptions of what worship is. I love my church, and because I love my church, I look forward. Do you know? This is the highlight of my week. Even during football season, this is the highlight of my week. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Some of you didn't say anything. You must not be Bama fans. Um, <laughs> but this is the highlight of my week. Because when I get, to, I get to see you and I get to sing praises to the Lord. I get to be blessed by the fellowship of God's people. I get to be fed on God's word. Listen, do you know, you ever thought about this? The preacher... If he does what he's supposed to, and he spends the hours praying over and pouring over and studying and preparing, can you imagine how blessed I get week after week just getting ready? I mean, it, it, it's, 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 this is a glorious time for me. Why do I love to worship? Worship is personal. In Psalm 34, 1 through 3, the passage that we looked at a while ago, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. There, there really are two dimensions of worship that are described in the Bible. One is is a, a community type of worship, uh, a, uh, a corporate type of worship, and then there is private worship. Now let me, let me add something here. Do you know how to make church even more exciting? Do you know how to make church even sweeter? Do you know how to make worship even more meaningful? Spend time worshiping privately before you get here. Cultivate your quiet time. Get in the Word. Spend some time praying. Spend some time loving on the Lord. And listen, have Him prepare your heart to receive His Word when you get here. And worship will be even more meaningful because worship is personal. It's, it's what God gives me the privilege of doing. And by the way, I... <laughs> Uh, sweet Libby, I tell you, she's the best thing ever happened to me other than Jesus. I, she's, she's, uh, she's my sugar plum. She's my roast beef. She's, uh, 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 she's my cherry pie. She's, uh, she's everything. Love sweet Libby. And she never gets tired. T-A-R-E-D, tired. She never gets tired of me telling her, honey, I love you. <laughs> Now she may act like she does, <laughs> but she really doesn't. May I tell you, we serve a God in heaven who never gets tired of his children saying, Father, I love you. Lord Jesus, I love you. Holy Spirit, I love you. Worship is personal. Now, corporate worship is sometimes seen as more celebrated, but you can, you can have celebrated, enthusiastic worship privately. It doesn't have to be just corporately, but it's personal and it is corporate. I wrote myself a note and I said, our private worship prepares us for corporate worship. <laughs> I know this has never happened here. But I've pastored a long, long time at all kinds of churches. And every once in a while, I'll get a little drift of somebody says, well, I didn't enjoy that service today. Sang those old ditties. Sang that chorus 15 times. <laughs> I've heard all that kind of stuff, and you have too. And then I ask myself the question, if you just come for you to get blessed, you're going to miss the greatest of God's blessings. But listen, if you come having had your heart warmed by the Holy Spirit, and you come saying, Lord, I just want to hear a word from you about worship. I want to hear a word from you about service. I want to hear a word from you, Lord, about holiness. I want to hear a word from you about, and you just fill in the blank. And Lord, I just want to tell you, before I get to church, 
I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And I just want to lift up your name because you alone are worthy. Worship is personal as well as corporate. Number two, worship is devotional. Psalm 34, bless the Lord, O my soul, is devotional. Psalms is a book of worship. Somebody once said that worship is not form, but it's fellowship. And the goal of worship is to honor God. It's not about us. Sometime, and make, make yourself a little note, Psalm 136 has 26 verses. And every verse has this phrase, His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. You know what the Lord wants us to know? When your doctor gives you a bad report, His mercy endures forever. When somebody breaks your heart and somebody disappoints you, His mercy endures forever. When life seems to fall apart and you're not quite sure how you're going to handle what your load you're carrying, His mercy endures forever. And His grace, as Jesus said to Paul, is always sufficient. And you learn that in worship. Worship is personal. Worship is devotional. Worship, I like this one. Number three is joyful, expressive and celebrative. Now, we're not going to read them again, but in Psalm 98 and Psalm 100 and Ezra chapter 3, they talked about thanksgiving and praise and singing and a loud celebration of praise and loud weeping. By the way, if you don't understand what the weeping is, I am a squaller. I sling snot and squall regularly. Excuse me, that's a Greek term. So, sometimes I get blessed, Joe, beyond measure. I just, I, I just, all I can do is, is squall. And sometimes I just want to lift my hand and say, Lord, thank you. You're an awesome, awesome, awesome God. But the, the principle is worship ought to be expressive and celebrative and joyful. You may not be a crier. Libby is not a crier. She's got a heart of stone. <laughs> she doesn't really. She doesn't. She's really got a heart as big as Texas. But some people just aren't criers. But I'm a squaller. And uh, and and I'm a I'm a hand lifter. By the way, you don't have to raise your hands to worship. Does that help some of you? Make you feel better? It doesn't mean you're less spiritual or more spiritual. It just means just be who you are. And by the way, let the person sitting next to you be who they are. And if somebody wants to raise their hand, men have at it. And if you don't want to, that's all right. You worship as, as, as however your heart is moved by the Lord because worship is personal, worship is devotional, and worship is joyful, expressive, and celebrated. One of the things that uh, I, I, I want to remind myself of, and I like this, worship here. Now, you may want to write this down. This is good. <laughs> Even if I did say so or am fixing to say so. Worship here is rehearsal for there. <laughs> Do you get that? Nick, write that down. Worship here is rehearsal for there. And if you don't enjoy celebrative, enthusiastic, glory, hallelujah, praise God, worship here, you got a big adjustment there. Because I believe we're going to worship throughout all the ages. And praise the King of glory. Worship ought to be joyful, expressive, and celebrative. Number four, worship ought to be varied. Varied. I said, Brother Jack, what do you mean worship ought to be varied? The Israelites shouted. They sang. They, they used the timbrel. They used the trumpet. They wept aloud. They shouted with joy. And the, the truth is that there's, there's no one style. 
Worship is not a style, it's an expression. And while this room is full of people who love the Lord Jesus, there'll be a lot of different ways that we personally express our love for the Lord. Some people are very quiet, and it's all right, and they worship the Lord and love Jesus just as much as the one who's more expressive. The thing is, realizing this, sometimes worship is expressed in tears. Sometimes it's expressed in laughter. Sometimes it's expressed in, in just lifting up our hands and singing praise to the Lord. Sometimes it's just simply an opening up of our hearts and simply saying, Lord, thank you and I love you and bless you. There is no one form, one way of worship. And, and I think the key to worship, stay with me and I'm almost done, is come and pour out your heart to the Lord and tell him you love him and adore him for who he is and praise him for what he is and what he's done. And however God has molded and made you to be comfortable in doing that because he is the object of our worship. By the way, in Ephesians 5, 19, he says we're to speak to ourselves, to each other, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You ever thought about that? Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, I, I, I wasn't going to say this, but I'll, I'll say it real quick. <clears throat> I've got some dear friends who are of other persuasions, theologically. And they'll say things like, I don't believe you ought to have music in church. Now, I respect that, but I think, read the passages. Praise the Lord with a cymbal. Praise Him with a heart. Praise Him, Lord, with a tambourine. Praise Him with a trumpet. Praise His holy name. Every instrument, uh, <laughs> even a box, <laughs> can praise God. You know how I can tell when Ronnie is getting happy playing the drums? A drumstick goes flying out across the floor. <laughs> but you see, what he's saying here is the instruments are used to pray, and, and psalms mean singing the scripture. That's what the psalms, the psalms are, are scripture, and they're songs of truth, and they were sung. Hymns are songs carefully composed to praise God. By the way, I was raised on hymns. I love the hymns. Oh, I love them. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more but the master. Of the sea, heard my despair and cry from the waters. He lifted me. Now, safe. Hey, bye. Can you say amen? amen? Woo! I tell you, I love the hymns, but I love the choruses. I love it all because it all says, Jesus, we love you. And spiritual songs are like choruses because they're often created when someone is singing spontaneously unto the Lord. You know what I'm looking forward to in heaven? <laughs> well, several things. One is the marriage supper of the Lamb. You don't have to worry about fat grams or calories or <laughs> cholesterol. <laughs> marriage supper of the Lamb. Look at it. But I'm looking forward to hearing Vestal Goodman. Singing heaven sounding sweeter all the time. I'm looking forward to hearing George Beverly Shea sing again. Looking forward to hearing some of the great singers of the past that God's used to bless in my heart. I'm just looking forward to being in a place where praise is the norm. And people aren't afraid to get happy in Jesus. By the way, Vestal Goodman.
I have, I have several heroes. Can I tell you this real quick? <laughs> Roy Rogers. One of our grandsons will be 21. We, we, got, we got a grandson, almost 21. He spent the night with us this week. He's from Memphis. At about 9 o'clock, gun smoke came on. <laughs> now you're wondering, where in the world are you going with this one? I said, Owen, you ever seen, you know who Matt Dillon is? He said, never heard of him. <laughs> what planet have you been living on? You ever seen gun smoke? Never seen gun smoke. So I made one of my greatest contributions to my family lineage and I exposed my grandson to Matt Dillon and Festus and Miss Kitty and Doc and Gunsmoke. <laughs> my greatest hero is not Matt Dillon or the Lone Ranger or Roy Rogers. but it's Jesus. He's the hero who left his home in glory to come to this old sin-cursed world to die in my place. And he came to give me righteousness that I couldn't attain. And he came to give me a home in heaven. You think I'm going to hold back worshiping him? Oh, no. You think I'm going to be shy about worshiping him? Oh, no. I want to lift up his name above every name because he alone is worthy. Number five. Worship. Thank you. Y'all are so blessed. I don't preach like this everywhere. <laughs> Usually I'm more, I'm more dignified. <laughs> Worship ought to be responsive. This should have been my last point, but I made it number five. Worship is responsive. Isaiah, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the angel took a coal off the altar and put it to his tongue, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. But Isaiah ended by saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. Do with me whatever you want to do. You know that's what worship will do. When you spend time listening, expressing, and loving him, worship is not complete until you've said, Lord, do in my life what you want to do. And lastly, worship is refreshing. Refreshing. <laughs> I just get so blessed when I, when I come to God's house and, and with God's people. I remember being in Dallas a number of years ago with Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, I've been to a lot of places at Southern Baptist Convention. I went to Las Vegas one time. <laughs> Me, Las Vegas. Now, you say, Brother Jackie, what do you mean? Did you, did you even one time, did you just one time put a quarter in one of those one arm slot things? I did not. Not one time. And there was a reason why. I did not want the Decatur Daily to read, Fat Preacher Dies at Slot Machine. <laughs> but I I remember being in Dallas, number 45,000 messengers, 45,000. They stood up and started singing praise to the Lamb and amazing grace. And you're talking about an old country boy from Lacey Springs about to have a spell. And I thought, Lord, this must be a little bit about what heaven's going to be like. Worship is refreshing. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall man up with wings as eagles and they shall run and not be weary and walk and not faint. True worship blesses the worshiper. James, I think, said it best. 
draw nigh to God. That's worship. And he'll draw nigh to you. If you need a blessing, learn to worship. If you need grace, learn to worship. If you need strength and wisdom, learn to worship. If you need to be more like Jesus, learn to worship. And remember, worship down here is just rehearsal for worship up there. Lord, here am I. Send me. Let's bow together. Lord, our hearts cannot express the depth of our love for you and the breadth of our adoration for you. And I pray that you'll help us every time we gather to be people who enter into worship with thanksgiving on our hearts and praise on our tongues. And Lord, may, may we not get so hung up in different styles, but just, just pour out our hearts to you and just love on you and lift you up. And we pray with Isaiah, Lord, having worshipped you, here am I. Send me. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, in a moment we're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. I don't know what God may be doing in your heart. God may be speaking to somebody about making this your church home. For the last four or five weeks in a row, we've been blessed with people coming down the aisle saying, Brother Jackie, I want to make Shoal Creek my church family. We're so blessed. If that's the, your case, you come. and We'll write for your letter or get the information we need. We'll take care of all that for you. It'll be our joy to welcome you here. Maybe you've come and you, you really don't have a relationship with the Lord. Maybe you've never been saved. And you'd come and simply say to me or, or Brother Johnny, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus today. I want to live for the one who died for me. I want to know that I have a home in heaven. You come, we'll tell you how to be saved. Or maybe you're carrying a heavy burden. You're going through a tough time. You just need to get in the altar and spend some time with God, asking for grace and peace and strength and wisdom. Just say with Isaiah, Lord, here am I. Do in my heart all that you want to do. Father, thank you for worship. And now we conclude, Lord, this hour of worship by responding to the call of God upon our hearts. Help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen.